I'm very honored and um, proud to um, give this lecture in your center for German education. And uh, for me, it's a big thing that it, it is possible in China to have this Institute for Moral, Inst uh, Moral Education. So uh, uh, hopefully this will be the beginning of a collaboration and uh, hopefully uh, the pandemic situation will be in future less problematic so then we can perhaps meet face to face and have some, um, some discussions. So I want to present you some insights of an uh, actual uh, research project called Elbe. Uh, by doing this, I have a lot of things uh, to say in advance. So first I will give some examples. Examples concerning attitudes. In this attitudes, ethos um, is perhaps yeah, manifest will become manifest. Then I will say something um, to the European tradition of ethics and ethos by Plato, Aristotle, Kant and Herbert. And then I will turn to school and teacher ethos and to the research we are doing in this field, international research. And then uh, last but not least, I will present the uh, project and the forthcomings of the project, um, starting with an example from a student in an inter internship report she wrote in, in a German or in, a, uh, in an Austrian school. I, I, I hear something. Uh, okay. Okay, I will, I will first, I will give you some insights like thesis, a preliminary remark to what I think is ethos and attitude. So um, this is a thesis and I will come back to this in my lecture and try to argue um, in this point. So the question is, what is ethos? What is an attitude? So the thesis is, you can have an attitude, you can take it, you can keep it, you can lose it, but all above, you show it. You show it with your body. It's a bodily exposure. It can be firm or ambiguous with one's attitudes. One relates to the world in a certain way. This is also shown in the corporal posture or a statement. This statement or positioning can be crooked, straight, limp, tight, and so on. So attitudes contain, contain a statement and a positioning. In this positioning, distinctions are made. These distinctions are made in judgments. It's therefore a matter of moral judgment what is good or bad, what is right or wrong, what is justified or not justified. So these judgments are not exclusively theoretical, but rather practical. They are shown in action. Attitude is latent and permanent. It's shown in action. So with this concept of attitude or ethos, we, can, we find ourselves in the area of moral morality or virtue ethics. In the European tradition, attitudes that are considered good are called virtue in the Greek sense of proficiency, arete. This is a Greek word. word. In Greek, attitudes is called ethos. Ethos is a Greek word. Uh, uh, invented by Plato, Aristoteles, and so on. The pedagogical goal of virtue ethics is the formation of attitudes or the formation of character. I will explain it afterwards. But first, to show what I mean with attitudes and ethos, I will give you three short examples. First, this is a Christian attitude, the Christian attitude of charity. Uh, you see here uh, two persons, two women, 
In Christian short, thought, the highest form of love, signifying the reciprocal love between God and man, is made manifest in the unselfish love of one fellow man. In Christian theology and ethics, charity, this is a tra translation of the Greek word, word agape, means love. It's most eloquently shown in life, teachings, and in the death of Jesus. So they, these women, they follow the life of Jesus by showing in their life charity. This is on the left, the Holy Mother Teresa. She is a missionary in the Roman Catholic Church, and she helps people in India dying of AIDS, HIV, leprosy, tuberculosis, and she risks her life for the people in the name of Christian charity to help them. Um, Edith Stein, she's a philosopher. Um, she wrote her thesis at, uh, uh, by um, um, Edmund Husserl. Then she was taken in the Catholic Church through baptism, and she was killed by the uh, Nazis in a concentration camp in, the, in, the, in 1941, because on the one hand, she has a Jewish origin, on the other hand, it was her Christian faith. And then she, uh, she proved her attitude, represented and demonstrated the Christian values of charity, even under threat of death. So this is one example, two women representing the attitude of charity in a Christian way. Another uh, example, this is the attitude of solidarity, helping each other. As you know, um, uh, the current invasion of U Ukraine by the Russian army, uh, a lot of refugees are coming to uh, Germany, to Europe. More than three million people are, mm -hmm. uh, are moving to the West, are moving to oh, no. Berlin, are moving to... Um, to Germany, um, more than uh, all of this, it's, it's the big, biggest refugee movement in Europe since the World War II. It's very, very big. And um, many refugees, um, uh, the people are trying to help them, trying to, uh, to show their attitude of solidarity in concrete ethical actions. Refugees are taking um, um, home, um, even in very small apartments. You see it in the picture below. A picture above, you see a great demonstration against war. Um, against uh, uh, more than 100,000 people in Berlin. Uh, pupils try to support the pupils of Ukraine. They give them, they give them rooms, they donate food. They give money, even they share their pet, their pets. You see it in the in the uh, um, picture right on the right hand side. So this is an attitude of solidarity, helping each other, helping because people they suffer, they uh, they are poor. So we try to help them. Another third um, example. It's in our West, Western, um, Western civilization, we call it a democratic attitude. So what does it mean? So in Germany, we have a big dis discussion, a big discussion in all media and in, uh, in, in, in families everywhere about vaccination and about uh, the problem of what uh, vaccination. Should or must all people be vaccinated? Of what age? What, what exceptions should be made? In vaccination, even in effective means of dealing with the pandemic, do we, can, can we stop the pandemic with, uh, with uh, uh, vaccination? So there are a lot of dis uh, uh, discussions in public, in political. We have a lot of demonstrations uh, in different medias, uh, uh, in classic print media, in social networks, and so on. You see it on the left, uh, you see in um, the demonstration, supporters uh, show a sign 
it says vaccinate instead of scold. And the right hand picture, it's a demonstration of the opponent, op opponents of vaccinations. They say not to compulsory vaccination. So well, there's a struggle about it. And we think democracy works through public and joint negotiations, argumentations, disputes, and also demonstrations in freedom of opinion. So in politics, the question is, how do we want to share or to shape our community? To do this, we have to argue, we have to negotiate, we have to deliberate, we have to dispute, as Hannah Arendt says. Hannah Arendt, she's an important political philosopher and a phenomenologist. So these are important practices from, for political decision making in the community and in the public. So these disputes take place in the street, in media and in parliament. In parliament, we have a lot of disputes on this. Um, in the moment uh, um, um, of the uh, discussion, is vaccination or should be vaccination be compulsory? So in the German par par parliament, the voting on compulsory vaccination which for the liberal thinking is a strong encroachment on personal freedom and self-determination, the ob ob obligation was removed according to party affiliation. Each member voted according to his or her own conscience. Uh, conscience means a moral conscience. So conscience is a place in the mind or the consciousness of man where judgment about good and evil are made. So they say every individual person can do this ethical judgment. So this term goes back to Martin Luther and his um, Protestant theology. He confronted the king defending, defending his new theology in relation to his decision of conscience and his attitude. Here stand, I cannot do it otherwise. So this this, this judgment in conscience are made and they are one basis, one fundament of ethical, ethical practices and ethical theory in the Western world. And it works not only in the public, it works in the parliament, it works in the media. So this might be another example for an attitude or an ethos here it's an example of a democratic attitude, recognition of diversity and plurality in a diverse um, uh, world and um, in a in a um, in a diverse community. So, um, first conclusion. Um, Herr Pinkmann, ethos. Yeah. Ja, ach so, Sie müssen jetzt übersetzen. Ja, Entschuldigung. Gut, danke. 啊,好的,剛才文官教授講的這一段,呃,大致的這個要點呢,我我現在這個複述一下。首先就是說,呃,講到這個attitude,或者說ethos,那麼我們首先要看到的它是一種態度,或者說姿態,啊,那麼這個
，例如救助救助难民。第三种呢是民主的 attitude， 就是承认差异和多元，然后在这个相互的讨论当中进行商讨啊，承认。这个差异和多元的存在，并且就共同的这个呃主题进行争论讨论，而这些判断、争论、讨论、发表意见以及态度等等，它的一个基础呢，就是在西方的这个传统当中，就是良知啊，良知是这一切的出发点。那么，就像马丁·路德曾经讲过的那样，除了这样做之外，我别无选择，也就是出于良知的去。呃，进行的这样的一个判断，这里还有一个 ，Betty， 马克·贝塔，啊，双彩的修的 ，OK， first conclusions， 嗯、um, ，on ethics and ethos， ethos is a moral attitude in action， in taking a stand or position on ethical problems and questions， second。Ethos is an attitude refers to moral values. In the European tradition, these are represented by the individual. They are shown as a statement or position. In the Christian and moral philosophical uh, tradition, the place of this moral decision is the conscience. Give this. Um, ethos as action also takes place in judgments. Judgments are based on distinctions. Distinctions are the result of a decision. This decision is shown in action as position. Ethos is thus based on a moral decision-making ability, on the ability to make judgments. We can distinguish social norms、um, on the one hand and moral values. Social norms refer refer to fixed rules in in, in institutions. Societies, cultures, for example, traffic rules. In contrast, values are general ideas of aims, aims of practice. In the European tradition, these are understood as virtues like honesty, justice, equality, patience, humor, kind, kindness, integrity, and so on. So. But now we have in Europe a big problem because what is considered as values is not sure. It's discussed. So we assume that there are no generally binding, universal values, but only points of orientation that are also socially, scientifically. Culturally disputable, unambiguity and universality are replaced by difference, diversity, and plurality. Values and norms are argued and discussed. What are universal val values? Which values are more important than others? What are fundamental fundamental values? What are our limited cultural Values in the so-called reflective modernity or post-modernity, the question of how values can be legitimized, legitimized, or justified, also becomes crucial. Which instances of justification are binding? Is it still the Christian God or the religions? If so, which religion? Or are there traditional ideas, values, or families, of help or love, like in Confucianism, perhaps? Are there anthropological ideas of the human being? Or are there democratic values of human rights formulated in laws? Or is it the aforementioned consciousness, conscience of the in,、uh, individual? Or Last but not least, is there a legitimation of values through reason? This is what Immanuel Kant attempted in the Critique of Practical Reason, one very、uh, famous book of him, and established in the categorical imperative as a formal principle 
the principle of transcendental reason. These instances of legitimations are thus also plural, are also disputed and debated. The moral decision-making ability mentioned above must therefore engage with these plur pluralities and re relativities of values and norms, and at the same time, their instances of legitimation. It is precisely the plurality that challenges the moral decision-making ability to examine, understand, consider, comprehend, evaluate, and judge. Back to ethos. Ethical situations are therefore situations in which decisions are made and positions are taken on the basis of conscience. So far, I have only talked about ethos as an ethical problem. I have not talked about whether attitudes can be learned or can be practiced. So the, the next point will be the pedagogical perspective. Is it possible to learn an ethos or to learn an attitude? Or perhaps it, it's a natural thing, so you can get it by nature. So this is the next problem. And the next question I will investigate with Plato. But first I will stop. Gut, uh, und ich jetzt Übersetzung wissen. Uh, 刚才Brinkman教授讲到这个ethos呈现为行动中的道德态度而且呢ethos是作为一种态度涉及道德价值的可是在现代晚期和后现代道德价值面临着一个危机也就是说普遍有约束力的价值似乎越来越走向衰落
and on the other hand, moral values. So this, this problem I will show afterwards between the norms on the one hand and the moral orientation on the other hand. And there might be in some situations, as I will show afterwards, a conflict. So uh, the next question is, is this possible to be learned? Going back to Plato in this his famous Menon dialogue, he asks, can whether, uh, whether virtues can be taught at all? Is it possible? If virtues cannot be learned, then a pedagogical question is superfluous. After this initial question of whether virtues, that is, whether good action is teachable, in Greek, didakton, he comes to the question, what is teachable at all? What is learnable at all? What is not teachable and what is not learnable? Why can we learn something that we do not yet know? If one always have already known something in order to learn. At this point, I refer to the master lesson given by Dietrich Benner in the context of his didactics of science and theory of education in which Plato's Menon, Menon dialogue is an important example. So I, I won't, I won't uh, say this in extension. I would like to focus differently in three tips. First, he's, Platon distinguishes between practice, this is here in Greek, ascesis, natural conditions, this is physis, and teaching, matesis. These are three points. They are, they are essential components of the learning process. We can call this the triangle or the pedagogical ternary. In his theory of learning, Plato gives preference to knowledge over practice. All thinking, perceiving and acting is subordinated to reason, in Greek logos, and is arranged on an ascending sequence of stages of the lower cognitive faculties to thinking and seeing the highest truths, the highest truths Plato calls it's the idea, the ideas, the idea of truth. Idea tua, tu agatu. So this, this concept of learning and this triangle is taken by Aristoteles some years later. He is a scholar of Plato. And he, he is becoming a problem. So this hierarchy of Plato becomes a problem and Aristotle criticizes. He made a very famous distinction between theoretical reason on the one hand and practical reason on the other hand. And practical reason refers to moral and to moral decisions. So he says perhaps a moral judgment is another way another form of judgments than theoretical judgments driven by logos. By, um, so he, he distinguishes practical and theoretical reason, even habituation or habits on the one hand, and um, knowledge and thinking on the other hand. Bodily um, judgment on the one hand and reflection on the other hand. Aristotle assumes, in contrast to Plato, that there is an, that there is an ascending path from experience to knowledge, from practice to theory. However, this is interesting because Aristotle starts with experience and not with the ideas, or not with logos, not with reason. So in the classical text that describes the distinction between theoretical knowledge and practical knowledge, it is the Nicomachean ethic, the Nicomachische ethic. In order to determine the good, the agathon in Greek, Aristotle starts with practical activity. 
with the concrete and the factual. This is where repetition comes into play. And afterwards, I will say something about practice. He says, thus by building, one becomes a builder. By playing an instrument, you become a, a, a play, an instrument player. If you act righteously, you become righteous. So it's the doing, it's a practice which makes someone as someone. That means in ethics, the repetition, the habits are, are, um, are the appropriate thing and the appropriate way to achieve morality and virtues. To become a good man means to practice, to make a repetition, and this repetition action leads to habits to practice this ability. So the triangle is changed. Now we have a, cha a triangle between matices or knowing, then experience, empiria in Greek, and praxis, action. So this is, um, according to Aristoteles, we can say we learn how to act well through practicing. It is only by doing that I become an expert or uh, become be able to do good things. Not information, not knowledge, not knowing that is enough to become a good guitar player, a good teacher, or a virtuous per person. They all have to practice and practice in repetition. In ancient Greek, Greece, these were different forms of practicing. Gymnastic, yeah, mental practicing, memorizing, dietetic practicing, eating and drinking, the not too much in the right time, right place, and so on. Economic practicing, and so on. And I refer to Michel Foucault in his latest writings. He investigated this practice, these forms of practicing. He calls it um, 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 a souci de soi, eine Selbstsorg. Um, so, okay. So I will stop here and perhaps the Tao you can translate. You have to switch from Mayder就是即便在困难的情况下也按照道德要求或适当的方式进行行动,开展行动的意志的力量。如果这些美德在行动中反复的表现出来,就会形成态度。态度所以态度总是在对相对于他人相对于社会习惯习俗和道德价值的语境下显现出来的在柏拉图的思想当中态度或者说意思是不是能被学习的呢这个问题柏拉图是从一个三维关系的这个角度来谈的那么就是说
。这里讲的主要的就不再是知识，不再是信息，而是经验和行动。善的行动能力是通过练习才能形成的。Thank you. Okay, thank you. So, if I said before that attitudes and ethos are based are based on differences, distinctions. And the way we do um, distinctions, we call just judgment. So it will be questionable. How can we practice judgment? Is it possible to learn how to judge? This is the question Immanuel Kant, Kant put, and he gives the answer. Um, the process of judgment takes place in practice and experiences, as we heard. Kant defines the structure of reflection between knowledge and abilities as the power of judgment. Urteilskraft in German. For him, the ability to judge is a special talent that does not want to be taught at all, but only to be practiced in action. Judgment, in Kant's sense, is the ability to subordinate the particular to the general. So this is determining judgment. Or to creatively find the general first, reflecting judgment. Reflexive und besondere Urteilskraft. Teachers must not, must not only have knowledge of rules, know what perhaps the state or the institution says by law, but they must also to be able to apply these rules into practice. The application requires the ability to judge in order to be able to judge, there's a need for experience, which has a special relationship to knowledge and a need for practicing in which judgment are exercised in a practical way. Acquiring or sharpening the ability to judge requires question, uh, uh, practicing. So after that, Herbert, criticized the Kantian model based on reason and transcendence, and he specified the shared practice in teaching with the concept of pedagogical tact. The pedagogical tact of the teachers requires a sensitivity or resonance or responsiveness on the part of the teacher who adapts action to the situation and above all, to the person, to the pupil. Aristotle, Kant, and Herbert agree that good and capable practice does not simply apply or execute rules, but applies them according to the situation and according to the individuals. So this is based on experience, not only knowledge, and based on this text, based on judgments. They can be practiced and proved in practice. So this might be uh, the theory of judging concerning moral judgments as the basis of ethos and attitude. So this is a shift, a shift away from knowledge, theory, towards ability, towards experience, towards practical, uh, practical knowledge and practical judgments. So um, in the following, this aspect becomes significant for the exper experimental learning and practice theory of the pedagogical ethos. In the ethos concept of our project Elbe, which I'll present afterwards, this is the perspective of experimental learning. And these guys, 
Gadama, Book, Maya Drave, Lipitz and myself, we tried to apply this theory of uh, experience, I quoted now with Aristotle and so on, into learning. It's a theory of learning, experimental learning, or a theory of learning as experience. So I cannot explain this in a whole, but in this, we start not with theories, not with terms, we start with practice and with examples, with situations. And we uh, think that these experience, these examples are not examples in that rules are generalized, but similarities are analogized. analogized. So examples can ex encourage people to take stand to position themselves, to practice, and to exercise moral decision makings. So when we read or discuss on examples, when we understand, we comprehend, we exchange, we dispute them, by the way, doing this, we practice judging. Because I ask you then, so that's interesting what you are saying, Christina, but can you please explain it to me? What are your perhaps reasons why you said this? So I try to make you to show and share your judgments with me. So these examples show us a path, a path to practice, a path to situations and I will say afterwards to situations which are, which are shared in ambiguity because they are not clear. Yeah? They are not clear as laws or rules. So we can, we can dis discuss and share these practical situations. So, Tao, I, I will stop here. Good, thank you. 呃，那么到了呃近现代哲学的这个时间段呢，呃，就是代表人物就是康德和尔巴特，呃，那么 ethos 是一种态度和立场的表达，是一种表态，那么判断呢就是 ethos 的一个基础部分，是一个是其一部分，判断的过程发生在实践和经验的过程中，康德就认为判断力是不能教的，只能练习。教师不仅要有关于规则的知识，还必须能够应用这些规则，这就需要判断力。那么，获得判断力和提高判断力就需要练习。赫尔巴特则批判康德的先验哲学观点，但是他在呃这个方面呢，呃与与康德有一定的这个关联。他提出了教育机制的概念。教育机制就要求教师有一种响应或者共鸣的感知力，以按照具体的人和情境来调整行动。那么我们贯通起来看，就是亚里士多德、康德和赫尔巴特都认为，好的行动不是简单的去应用或执行规则，而是根据具体情况和具体的人来应用他们。道德规则不能简单的通过认知来学习，啊。这呃，道德这个道德的判断力是基于经验，而不是知识啊，必须在实践中反复实反复训练。那么 ，ethos 也是这个意思，它只能通过练习和实践来获得和提高，所以它与理论知识是不同的啊。知识和能力，它的一般性已经体现在生活的世界当中。已经体现在实践的前理解当中了，啊，这对于教育的 ethos 就非常重要。那么下面就会讲到啊，布林克曼教授主主持的研究课题，在他的课题当中就说到，这个 example 是非常重要的，是一个核心的手段，因为从实例，从 example 当中，呃，这个 example 是从主观的和生活的世界这个事业当中出发的。
，于是呢，实力就能使我们有可能重建经验，并且获得新的经验，同时形成对经验的意识和反思。所以，实力的意义并不在于一般的规则的应用啊，不是不是一种对规则的具体运应用或泛化或者一般化，而是在直觉的理解当中。形成意识啊，形成判断，在理解例子的时候，不是不是在演绎规则，而是在类比，而是在进行类比相似的地方，所以判断力就在这种分析和评价当中呢得到提升。给大家提醒。Thank you. The next point, I will uh just say three. Very small um, and um, short hints to the international research on teacher ethos we are referring to, and we had uh, two days before um, a discussion with um, this um, um, editors. But unfortunately, Fritz Oser he died this year, last year, but with Karin Heinrichs, and in this. International discourse on teacher ethos. We have three research directions. I can and just I will uh, refer them and criticize them. So the first um, is the um, the approach defined as values or value orientations uh, in professional action. So they say values are orientation standards and guiding concepts. So they try it in this way, but nobody knows which values are relevant for teaching and learning contexts. So they perhaps say it is justice, but in schools and in teaching and learning, justice is always connected with performance and performance standards. So is this a problem? Not only an ethical problem, but this is a problem to define these values. So this is the first thing. The second thing, we know it, this is based on Aristotle and they say, um, et ethos, ethos can be defined in terms of a certain practical attitude or lived virtue. And they say you can acquire it through habituation or through practicing. But they cannot say what ethos is how legitimized. So we, we I just talked about this. You can legitimize ethos and values through different instances like uh, religion or tradition or reason or Confucianism and so on. So they, they have the problem with this fundamental instances of legitimation. And thirdly, and this is the main thing, uh, is ethos understood as a cognitive ability for moral judgment. This going back to uh, Jean, uh, Jean Piaget and his um, uh, uh, psychology of uh, evolution and to Kohlberg. And Kohlberg has invented a stage model of moral development. And they try to take this um, stage model and create some certain competence model of discourse management. So it's a, it's a, a approach based on, um, on cognitive abilities and discursive abilities. So it is clear, as I said before, this is not our approach. So I will criticize them in a phenomenological approach afterwards. So, Tao, please. 那么现在就进入到一个呃下一个话题，就是布林克曼教授要介绍他的呃主持的一个项目。这个项目是基于这样一个关于
Teacher ASOS 的学术讨论呃的语境。那么，在目前的已有研究当中，往往有三种对 ASOS 的定义。啊，第一种呢说 ASOS 是专业行动中的价值和价值导向。啊，第二种呢说是一种实践态度和德行。第三种呢是认为它是一种认知能力和道德能力。那么，这个呃，温康教授他将对这些啊进行一种现象学教育学的这个批判和，并且提出他的一个新的理解方式。So we did it. Our research in this Elbe project. I will、um, explain some background. So it is called ethos in the teaching profession. It's one perspective to professionalize teachers in a moral perspective. So we. Elaborated a manual for practicing a professional attitude and professional ethos. Manual means that we collected examples from、um, from internships of students. These are examples of pedagogical practice of the internship reports, and these. We think are documents of lived experiences of everyday teachers. It's not theory. It's that what happens in teaching and learning in the classroom. We took this, and these are examples. We try to、uh, we, we 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 have、uh, chosen, and perhaps they tell us the difficulties. The ambiguities and the challenges for the teachers to deal in a、uh, in an ethical way.、Um, we are three、uh, researchers from three universities: University of Innsbruck, University of Vienna, and University of Berlin. Humboldt universities. We have collected twenty four examples, and we checked it. We evaluated this manual in fifteen university seminars, and we had a lot of discussions with our、um, colleagues,、um, and we struggled with them because, as I said, they have another approach. So we try to sharpen our、uh, uh, approach in discussion, in struggling with our colleagues. So we have changed something now. But mostly, I will have three main features. These situations are not hierarchized along a model or standard, or well, about truth or something, something else. But we try to sort out this morality in these situations. Its evaluation is to remain open to the plurality and the interweaving. With different standards of judgment, so we have chosen the the examples to practice this legitimation of judging. Second, ethos is not taught as knowledge or competence; rather, in the focus is the perspective of this experimental learn. It is assumed that the formation of an ethos builds on previous experiences, and these experiences, perhaps pre-experiences or pre-judices, for a time, are then in the in dealing with the examples, irritated, challenged, and then perhaps new experiences. On this situation can be made, then perhaps opening up for new horizons of experiences、uh, are possible. And third, each example contains these ambiguities, because on this basis of ambiguity, we are able to interpret it and position it. In a different way, so、um, we try to pluralize the perspectives 
on the values, on the way of judging. It is not the way that we say, this is the truth, and then you have to learn it like a law. No. On the other way, we do it the other way around. We take situations which are ambiguous, which are full of plurality and diversity, and then we discuss the way of judging these situations by uh, interpreting, understanding, discussing, struggling, and so on. So this is the way. Uh, okay, I will stop. Tao, please.那么布林克曼教授的这个课题它的三个特征在这里列出来的我简单的复述一下第一个呢就是在处理有矛盾性的教学情境的不同策略是依据情境而选择的不是从一个普遍的规则当中演绎出怎么做应而对处理策略的评
他身边有一个老师和三个学生，就是这个老师是是正式老师啊，对 ，supervisor， 或者说是呃这个陪同的另一个老师啊，生活老师啊，有这个生活老师和三个学生，然后呢，根据规定。每一次郊游都必须有一定的数量的学生和两个老师同时在场陪同。那么这个时候呢，那个生活老师，那个 supervisor， 他呢就必须要采取行动了。那么他怎么做呢？他让两个学生陪这个女生回家，而其他的学生继续向前爬山。我呢，本来也可以陪这个女生回家的。可是，如果我陪他回家的话，这个郊游就必须终止了。所以，不管这个老师他怎么样决定，都不是完全妥当的。要听。Okay, so now I will explain five theses on pedagogical ethos, referring to this example and referring to the a discourse on. Uh, pedagogical ethos, and I try to interpret our approach. So I will start with the first thesis. Pedagogical ethos shows itself situationally, situationally as embodied attitude. Ethos is not a behavior, not a belief, not a competence. In contrast to competence, which puts skills and ability permanent, ethical action has to prove itself again and again in situations. It can therefore not be converted into a fixed stock, scaled or measured. Ethical action also does not function according to fixed rules. So there's an example by Roland Reichenbach, a colleague from the Zurich University. He has an example. A person or a pupil can act situationally below her level of competence without being denied her level of competence. Actually, one say she is competent because competence is an ability and skill is counted as a part of the person's stock. The pupil has only failed, failed in this moment. The pupil has a bad day or something like that. But it makes little sense to say and to claim that this person, X, is an honest person, even though she has lied and cheated several times. The action questions whether she has a virtue of honesty at all and makes it clear that she has lost this virtue in the meantime. Therefore, virtues are fleeting. They have to prove themselves again and again. They are not a competence. Secondly, it is not a behavior. In order to classify actions and, uh, as being based on ethos, ethos an understanding, an hermeneutic or hermeneological approach is needed because ethos and understanding ethos is based on meaning and meaning making. This is why we can understand it. So we have to capture the subjective experiences and the subjective experiences in embodiment, which includes uh, institutional, social contexts and places, and uh, the first-person uh, perspective uh, in, in this. So, relating to our example, I have to say perhaps three points. First, pedagogical act action and ethical action can contradict legal norms, and they can still appear morally justified. So not every legal action is a moral action, and not every moral action is a legal action. We have to differentiate this. 
The hiking day on the mountain is continued, although the law prescribes is other, otherwise. The success here lies precisely in the fact that rules are not sought and acted, but in the situation, in action, also taken contrary to the rules. We see the teacher's action and can embed them in overall situation, but we cannot directly conclude what her attitude towards the law, for the example, is how she sees her responsibility towards the pupils. It is not a behavior. It is an action. An action is much more than a behavior because in action, this meaning making processes and this processes of justifying and judging becomes relevant. So it is not what we see. It is the meaning of the action in this interwoven situation. What is the mere thing we have to watch? And in this, we can see this, what I call a, a statement or a, a positioning. So a positioning is a meaning making process in front of others. It is not a behavior. So I will stop here. Tao, please. Yeah,那么从呃联系着刚才的那个例子呢,啊就引出了五个论纲啊,第一个第一个观点,第一个论题就是说教育的态度啊教育的这个ASOS,pedagogical ASOS。不是信念或能力 那么结合刚才的这个例子来看呢，就可以得出三个结论：第一，教育行动可能与一定的规范相矛盾，啊，可能与法律规范相矛盾，但是它在道德上仍然是正当的。虽然法律另有规定，但是登山还是要进行，
conscience, Gewissen. This conscience proves itself precisely in and against external influences. In relation to our example, first, the ambiguity of the situation directly challenges the teacher. She cannot, she cannot escape it. And it, a decision has to be made in practice. The teacher has, is taken to task. She has to uh, position herself. The ambiguity in which the teacher finds herself is characterized by many dimensions. Legal demands, medical demands, responsibility towards the groups or the individual pupil who is ill, the correct assessment of the pupil statements, but also the responsibility towards the trainee uh, who wrote the internship report. This dimension of ambiguity cannot be scored against each other. There's no scaling of ethos. We cannot say, okay, the medical problem is more important than the social problem. But the decision, uh, in the decision, we have to take one. And then I will explain afterwards, we can justify it afterwards. So the decision, the, the explication of the justifying process comes after the action. It's not in the action because the teacher does not have time to discuss it, to understand it, to, uh, to do all these uh, things we, I, I talk about uh, in, the, in the judgment process. We do it in our seminars, but in action, you are not able to do it because there's a lack of time. So you have to decide to, to decide and to position yourself. How, please? The second question 这个ethos是通过带有矛盾性的实践得到体现的。矛盾性意味着教育情境的特点是对行动规范和价值观提出不同的、有时甚至是矛盾的挑战。矛盾性是实践情境的一个特征，因而人在实践中随时都可能面临
and especially to the pedagogical professional field, ethos, then thus can be understood as a practical attitude or practice virtue in a form of judgmental relation of situational practice with moral, cultural, institutional, or professional rules or values. So the bodily parts of judgment often cannot be captured in language. They cannot be explicit, made explicit. They are implicit. And they cannot be processed in a cognitive, rational reflection in this situation. So we can say that the teacher in this situation, uh, the, the action of the teacher is risky. The teacher not only risks that her decision itself will be later criticized by the others or by herself. When she says, oh yes, uh, I, didn't, I didn't know this or I didn't consider this, this, uh, this, uh, this, this point of view. So perhaps she made a decision and afterwards she says by herself, it was a wrong decision, but she has to take this stand and to make this decision in practice. All the pupils say, or the uh, perhaps the parents say, why, why did you do this? And she has to explain. But on the other hand, the judgment perhaps afterwards conflict with other judgments, with other norms, with other values huh? of parents, of the institution, the headmaster, and so on. So there is not a silver bullet. There's not a golden way to solve these problems. It is a risky way to take. It is, with other words, an existential situation for the teacher. Huh? She has to stand there as a person. And afterwards, she has to say, okay, this was my stance. This was my decision. And these are my, uh, these are my reasons. I can, I can give it to you. But perhaps they are wrong. They are ambiguous. They, there is not one universal truth and not law that can decide it. Thank you. Tao, please. 第三个论题讲的是这个ethos是基于道德判断，并体现在对情境的矛盾性做出回应的行动中的。所以我们将其理解为一种具身性的态度。在这里，呃，个人的判断可能是各不相同的。啊，每个人要都为自己的ethos对
we make oneself vulnerable. It's risky. Practicing judgment means that we come in this space of judging and we practice, as I put it uh, somewhere else, some practices of distancing, distancing, to slow down, to step back. And this perhaps enables us to think about it and to exchange our points of view to each other. We do it by reading, reading aloud, perhaps a deliberate irritation from the teacher, to queries, to perhaps taking a counter position and say, no, what you said is wrong. Think about this point, arguing, discussing, and so on. So in this, perhaps the process of judgment, the formations of dis distinctions itself becomes a topic of the seminar, of the learning process. So this is based on Kant, Husserl, Heidegger, and so on. So it's a theory of judgment. And in this, perhaps we can judge as a precarious act that always implies our vulnerable aspects. So we make oneself vulnerable in this. And that's why we practice this with examples, not in the real life world. So it's perhaps not the real world. And this perhaps is practices of distancing come into play. So um, I have wrote this in my last book. There's a chapter on practicing judge, judging in this practices of distancing. Um, okay. And then perhaps we find a way that even our values, our pre-experiences, but even our pre-values or yeah, pre-judgments come into play. So we can, we are able to distinguish and see this movement that distances us from ourselves from the situation. We stop the experimental process. Anhalten eine Erfahrungsbewegung nennt das um, Heidegger. To stop uh, experimental movement. We can bracken our points of view, put them aside. Husserl calls this epoche, a reduction. And we step back. We interrupt our judgment process step back from ourselves and reflect, come to us, come back to us, to our uh, judgment process in this um, uh, practical way. Tao, please. Yeah. So, the third question is this. The ethos of the Dao 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 这个ESOS刚才已经讲到过，它无法通过教学或知识传授而学得，而是它它的训练呢是一种判断的训练，判断只能通过练习来提高如何呃那么怎么做呢？不应该让教授认为通过对实力的分析可以提高判断呃判判
以及对自己的前见有一定的距离。呃，那么呃，布因克兰教授讲到制造距离的做法，包括呃，比如说阅读啊、呃，朗读啊、开、呃、这个讨论啊、小组会议等等，这个过程是一个反思的过程啊，不仅对规则和规范进行反思，而且也要对。在具体的例子当中应用这些规则规范进行反思啊，那这种反思呢，不能呃，不仅能够冲击自己的先入之见啊，不仅能够拓展自己已有的这个观念视野，而且还能够拓展自身的道德经验啊，形成新的 e t h o s OK， okay last thesis a concept of pedagogy. Pedagogical ethos must systematically refer to pedagogical fields and basic ideas. The background is that perhaps a pedagogical ethos is something else than an ethos in a in a more general perspective, because we have to deal with special pedagogical perspectives relating to learning and education. So then. We have to specify our thoughts on ethos in ref uh, uh, referring to these pedagogical topics or terms or practices. So,、uh, on the one hand, perhaps we can say yes. This example on the on the mountain refers to uh, ethical uh, terms and categories like justice. Is this justified to do to do to do this? Do it risky for the pupil who is going down because she's ill. To equality,、uh, is it is it perhaps a question of equality? Is every pupil handled in an equal way, or to integrity, the integrity of the person? Of the pupils and of the of the uh, of the uh, of the teacher, and the truthfulness of the persons. So it's not about truth; it is about truthfulness in this situation. In German, we say Wahrhaftigkeit. Yeah, and this leads to a, a pedagogical perspective.、Um, Uh, Max Scheler, a famous philosopher and phenomenologist, pointed it out because perhaps if we see the teacher, how she acts, what she decided, how she positions herself in front of the others, we can learn from her as a role model. Forbid, and this learning by example of someone's action. Aims at what we call bildung, but the、uh, it is not the the role model. My、uh, learning by role model does not mean that we afterwards the learning process takes the、uh, decision of the teacher as granted. No, we can learn、uh, although we can we see that the or we think. That the judgment is not right, then even then, we criticize her, we learn from her as a role model, because then we know we do not decide in this in this situation as her. We decided in other way. We has have sharpened our decision making ability. So perhaps in this formation. Herbert would say formation of the will through exemplary statements. We can formation、uh, uh, formation of the char character takes place as we are confronted confronted with the situations in a critical comparison, and then we can say, okay, we can learn in this perspective from the teacher. So,、um, the pedagogical relation of our ethos concept is not by describing what is pedagogically desirable, what is right, but by placing 
pedagogical reflecting categories in this example, like learning, educating, character, showing, and so on. And then perhaps we cannot learn what is good or bad, but we can learn how we can decide and we can practice our decision making ability in this point. So this is our perspective. And uh, my last point will be afterwards some didactical and methodological implications. But uh, first, I, I will over give or overhand to um, to Tao, please. 第五个论题讲的是教育的就是 跟随榜样学习这一切都取决于道德判断力Okay, thank you. So when we practice um, this moral decision ability, moral decision making ability, we lead the students into this space of ambiguity, this risky space of failure, of vulnerability, of uncertainty. And in this, we intend to encourage them to take a stand, to position themselves, to practice this decision-making ability, and to justify what they, uh, uh, what they think, what is good uh, or bad, right or wrong. And we do it in three steps. First, we collect different ways of reading of the example. Then, then now we, we ask, how does this situation present itself to me? What does it show for me? How do I feel about the situation? Have I experienced something similar myself? Then perhaps they can walk in, uh, work in small groups. And this, afterwards, we call it a pluralization of uh, perspectives is made possible, it's a phenomenological ethos, to pluralize the perspectives. Different perspectives are not evaluated. Uh, different perspectives are concealed as different values and norms. And then we challenge them to position and to justify their positions. Now we ask, uh, what is the reason why you, you think this? Perhaps you can refer to something, to a legitimization. Uh, is what, what is the instance of your legitimation? Is it the Christian God, or is it the law, or is it the tradition? What is it? So we ask about this. And this means that the students have to reflect on their own perspective and recognize cultural, social, and personal foundations of the influence of their readings and views. So they can think, perhaps the tradition is something from my parents. Is it what I want to see, what to do, or do I criticize it? So I have to think about my justification. 
And the last point is a deliberate irritation. So they should be moved to distance themselves and relativize their own position through deliberate irritation. So preconceptions, prejudices are thematized by this. Perhaps they can be broken through and enable new ways of thinking, new space opened up, new perspectives, perspective of others. So it's important to create irritations to reach moral decision-making ability through the evaluation of one position. Yeah? Perhaps a counterpart position might be, might be interesting or a position from another culture or another justification. Take it and discuss it. So we have this figure, it's uh, unfortunately in German. So here's this three step. We take the example, then it's a three step then become in this space of ambiguity, then the personal moral position takes place with the aim, with the goal, uh, practicing the moral decision ability. So, uh, this is the end of my uh, lecture. Thank you very much. So I hope perhaps there might be some insights in uh, moral philosophy, philosophy of ethics and uh, practicing ethics and ethos as practicing a moral decision ability. Thank you very much.